Good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren Albert. I'm the chair of the Antitrust Committee of the City Bar. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, once again, I have to t thank my good friend, Carol Handler, who organized everything and arranged for Professor Lemley to be here to celebrate the memory of her father's great lectures. Um, Professor Hempel, Hempel from last year is hopefully trickling in here at some point, but we have <laughs> his speech from last year over on the table in the back, which was such a terrific speech that I urge you all to take copies so you have it for your memories. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Carol now to speak a little bit about her father. And also, and a little bit, a little bit about, our, about today's speaker, uh, Professor Lemley. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's really wonderful to be here with you and to introduce today's speaker, Mark Lemley, whose career really embodies the richness and breadth of scope envisioned for these lectures by my father. Uh, the Milton Handler Antitrust Lectures began in 1948. Looking around the <coughs> room, I don't think I see many people who might have attended the earliest ones. But uh, the purpose was to present to the bar what was then an emerging and dynamic field of law. Uh, my father delivered them for 25 years, which uh, with like a virtuo virtuoso musician, an occasional return engagement. And for some years, they were delivered annually by his talented partners at Kay Scholler, of which Richard Storyer was at that time one who delivered a, a great lecture, um, and uh, many of whom had been his former students at Columbia. Thanks to Lauren in particular, and to the New York City Bar, they have now been revived. Like today's event, they were, they were crowded, uh, they, were, they were most often standing room because they were in the evening, and they were eagerly attended, and it's not simply because of their intellectual range and power, uh, or because of my father's tendency to take pithy zings at the Supreme Court jurisprudence of the period. Um, it was because of the professor's warmth and enthusiasm for his subject and his love of it that communicated itself to generations of students and to the audiences. Uh, he always understood that antitrust is not a field of ineluctable, unchanging principles, but rather one of time-sensitive values, uh, political values, and personalities, which, he said, went to the heart of the central nervous system of the economy. Um, in a 1998 interview with the New York Bar Journal, uh, just before he died, Professor Handler observed the following. I have had a very unique career. No one else is going to have the kind of luck to be the only one in a field that opens up and becomes one of the most important litigated fields. Well, many years later, uh, that has been proven untrue because our speaker today, Mark Lemley, has accomplished precisely that, essentially <coughs> creating the field of antitrust and intellectual property law and focusing on both, a field to which the importance of technology and media to a global society has given birth. Uh, I first got to know Mark's work when I was writing about anti-competitive settlement of patent disputes in the 90s and kept coming back to his groundbreaking articles and working papers. Then I began teaching antitrust and IP at USC Law School myself and found that his treatise on the subject uh, and his many and varied articles, books, and briefs contained an unprecedented array of insights and stimulating qualities in this field. About 20 years out of law school, Mark has already written over 111 articles and seven books. And if anyone knows how prolific my father was, uh, I think Mark is well on his way to, uh, to rivaling to rivaling that both in terms of amount of writing and quality of content. As the William A. Newcomb Professor of Intellectual Property Law and, and Antitrust Law at Stanford and Director of its program of Law, Science, and Technology, he similarly inspires generations of students and as a founding partner of Dury Tangri, his views are eagerly sought 
on the cutting edge issues of our time uh, that involve uh, particularly complicated intellectual property issues, especially those where the IP issues collide with competition values. In short, prepare yourselves for a, tr for a treat in the very best tradition of these lectures. Thank you, Carol, uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I walked into the building uh, this morning, and I came up the stairs, and <coughs> uh, turned, it turns out, the wrong way uh, to see a bunch of chairs lined up in front of a piano. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is just not going to end well. Uh, so we're here to talk. Um, uh, the flyer tells me about the intersection between uh, antitrust and intellectual property. Uh, and from one perspective, that is what we're here to talk about. But people have actually used a bunch of different terms to describe uh, the uh, uh, intellectual property antitrust relationship is one of the terms. Uh, conflict, there maybe is a conflict between intellectual property and antitrust. Attention. Uh, an interaction, an interface, all these are published terms to describe the relationship. Carol just said the collision uh, between uh, uh, IP and antitrust values. Uh, or my personal favorite, uh, and the one that uh, we use in our treatise, uh, simply the word and. IP and antitrust. And I think the different terminology and the sort of struggling to talk about what it is that happens where these two areas of law come together is in fact reflective of different ways of thinking about the relative role of each of them. The early traditional view of the intellectual property antitrust conflict was that it was a conflict. Right? The grossly oversimplified version is, well, uh, patents create monopolies and antitrust laws against monopolies, uh, so they're in conflict with each other. Right? Now, neither of those things is, in fact, uh, true as a general matter. Uh, they may be per true in particular cases. Uh, but for a long time, that was the way we thought about this relationship. And then beginning, I think, in the 1970s, uh, that view is challenged uh, by a number of folks from the Chicago School, Ward Bowman in particular, uh, who says, hey, look, both antitrust and IP are, in fact, uh, not in conflict. They're serving the same purpose. We're trying to achieve long-run economic efficiency. Uh, and they just serve that purpose in different ways. Antitrust serves the, for, serves the goal of economic efficiency uh, at a static level. Uh, it encourages competition among existing products. Uh, intellectual property encourages efficiency at a dynamic level. It encourages the creation of new products. Uh, and so they can happily live together. And that created what I think is uh, a new orthodoxy, one that is still uh, uh, in power today, uh, that says there's no tension, there's no conflict between antitrust and intellectual property. They simply live in separate domains. One deals with competition at the static level, and one deals with the creation of new things, with dynamic efficiency. And that orthodoxy, that way of thinking about the relationship between these two bodies of law, has, I think, had some uh, pretty significant implications. The first implication, I think, is if you think of these things as sort of two separate domains, um, we can talk about them as kind of uh, uh, bumping up against each other. But what happens naturally is that as one expands, the other recedes. Uh, so uh, if intellectual property is about new products and antitrust is about competition in products we already have, well, as we focus more and more attention on uh, dynamic efficiency, as patent law expands, we get more patents, uh, their, their uh, sweep and their importance in the economy is greater, antitrust law accordingly recedes. Uh, and this is the way it's been if you go back several hundred years. We've seen these kind of cycles of one law gets larger and at precisely the same time the other law gets smaller. Uh, antitrust recedes as intellectual property expands, and then we see a backlash. Uh, intellectual property contracts, and antitrust law expands uh, at the same time. But I think it has another and a more important implication. If the choice is between static efficiency and dynamic efficiency, IP got first pick. We're much better off with dynamic efficiency than we are with static efficiency. Now, I like competition. 
All right, competition is a good thing. Uh, but I like innovation more, and I think if you think about it, you feel that way too. Right? Ask yourself whether you'd rather be the richest person in the world in 1700 or an average citizen of the United States today. Right? You know, unless you don't particularly like transportation or communications or indoor plumbing uh, or a variety of other things, right? we are far better off today as a result of innovation uh, than anybody was 300 years ago. And even closer to home, if you think about the kind of changes that occur in particular products, um, a perfectly competitive market for eight-track tapes may be a wonderful thing, but I'd rather have an iPod. Right? And I think, again, that's probably generally true. Um, we are better off by far in a world in which we have uh, innovation than in a world in which we simply have a competitive market for products that are themselves unchanging. So, one might logically conclude, based on this new orthodoxy, fine, antitrust's got a place, but it's really got a pretty small place in the overall scheme of things, right? Uh, it's about, we can, we can worry about uh, uh, cartelization of, uh, of uh, uh, wheat markets or lysine or something like that. But when it comes to the important drivers of the economy, it's intellectual property. It's not antitrust that's playing the role. So I want to suggest in this talk that that orthodoxy, that understanding of the relationship between IP and antitrust is wrong, or at least is oversimplified. Uh, and the reason it's wrong is that it proceeds from a set of economic assumptions that we know to be inaccurate. Right? Specifically, it proceeds from the assumption that the way you get dynamic efficiency uh, is the Schumpeterian way. Competition won't drive the creation of new products on this view. We need monopoly or at least some insulation from competition in order to drive new products. Um, and sometimes that's true. But sometimes it's not true. Right? Sometimes it turns out that Joseph Schumpeter is not right, Ken Arrow is right, and competition actually can be a driver of innovation. There are a number of reasons to think that we ought not rely exclusively on uh, the uh, lure of monopoly or the implementation of monopoly to get us new products. Right? Monopolists might well be lazy. Right? Now, some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, but the value of competition is not simply that it lowers prices to the competitive level. The value of competition is also that it drives people to act 